Welcome to Lunch with Tech Leaders, where we have engaging conversations about software development and cloud engineering with industry leaders and subject matter experts. These episodes are created by the Great Lakes Tech Leaders, an online community of technology practitioners. Please come join the conversation by visiting gltl.rbn.ai. Again, that's gltl.rbn.ai. Now strap in, because we're deploying to production in three, two, one. My name is Jason Brown. I'm a cloud solutions architect with Right Brain Networks, and I'm your host for today. Joining me today is software and data consultant, Tom Kowalski. Howdy. Hi, Tom. Also joining us is subject matter expert and recurring guest on the podcast, Preston Frazier. He's a senior software engineer at the Interoperability Institute. Welcome back, Preston. Thanks, Jason. Happy to be here. All righty. So in this episode, we're going to discuss developer tools for serverless architecture. And I know there's uh, definitely a lot to say on the topic. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. But yeah, I'll, I'll kick it over to, to you, Tom, first. So when it comes to serverless environments, um, what challenges would you consider uh, developers commonly face? I'd say the biggest challenge is you know, the, the tools aren't usually the same. You know, especially if they are, you know, used to developing locally and, you know, want to keep doing that and, and using some of the, the same tools or, yeah, a- agents, the process and flow that they're used to. So I'd say that's, that's usually the biggest challenge. I think things are a lot better now than they used to when I first started, but, but there's still a, a a paradigm shift in the development process. And I think that's, that's just the, the hardest uh, for developers you used to doing something for a, a long time. And, you know, it's uh kind of a different way of doing it. So yeah, just embrace the right. change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you're used to, uh, just building locally, you know, for instance, if you're working on like a rest API, right. You just spin it up, spin up the web app locally to do some testing or some development to, um, see how things are are taking shape. Um, yeah, that looks, that flow looks completely different when you're working with, with serverless components. Um, especially if you're, you're trying to, um, develop for, uh, like, uh, uh, interconnected, uh, components, uh, like yeah, you know, for instance, lambdas, right? If you have a bunch of lambdas that you've got as a backend for your REST API, you know what do you do? You know, do you zip everything up and then upload it to to S3 and then reconfigure the lambda every time? I mean, that seems like untenable, right? So yeah, yeah, I think that that's a you definitely hit like one yeah. of the things in my mind. You know, I would certainly agree with Tom on that. You know, just an example. You're talking about spinning something up locally. It's hard. Let's, uh, you know, we talk about Amazon Web Services a lot here. So think about an API you can spin up locally versus, you know, using the API gateway. You really can't spin API gateway service up locally on your machine <laughs> easily. You know, it, it's it's something you, uh, that, you know, needs to come from libraries or like testing libraries. Otherwise, you're, you know, kind of deploying to maybe a dev account and you're using the services there from the web services. I agree. I think there's a ways to go in terms of locally developing with serverless technologies. I'm a little surprised that, you know, cloud providers haven't made it a little easier to maybe spin up a version of their services locally or have some kind of better um, ability to, to mock those services. There are some examples and I think we'll talk about those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And another thing that I just kind of touched on too, in terms of uh, challenges is testing, right? So being able to do, I mean, unit testing, you could do fairly locally. You know, if I'm writing in Python, I could just run Python for our pi test for uh, unit testing. But when it comes to integration testing or testing the um, components together, like as you're updating, making changes like that can get really cumbersome, like the changes to the flow that um, people may be unaccustomed to. But once somebody does start using these tools, getting getting into the flow, Preston, what would you say were some key advantages of do- adopting a serverless approach in app development? Like, what are some some gains that you start to see when doing so? Well, you know, certainly a lot of the gains are, are seen in in production environments with serverless because 
you know, the, the assumption and the idea is that you're really, you know, only running and paying for what you need to use. So you can really minimize the amount of time that those services are running. Um, you know, on the development side, um, usually with the way things are priced, if you're not doing the load testing, your, your development work is very, you know, very cheap to do with existing services. Um, if you're going the route of deploying your, you know, applications to a dev account first or a dev environment first before you're going to a production environment. So there's, there's gains there, um, in terms of, of the cost, you know, in terms of development, I think the paradigm switches a lot more to scripting your infrastructure and services, you know, everything's configured. You're not in it, it serverless lends itself more to a scripted infrastructure environment rather than, you know, this manual setup and configuration of services. Uh, I think that's really where you see a big difference in what you're going about doing um, day to day. You know, it's not just about writing the application code, but it's also about scripting those infrastructure pieces. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, we talked a little bit also about testing the changes to the flow. And that seems to be another thing too, is that you, these tools lend itself to that tighter integration between your app code and your infrastructure as code. And we'll, we'll get into some examples of tools that help allow you to do that. But yeah, we, can, can you guys think of any other ways that just development tools in general contribute to improving the overall developer experience in a serverless uh, deployment or development? I think certainly it's. Uh, maybe if it's not the first time you're building something, but say you're a new engineer coming onto a team or something, I think it's a lot quicker to, or, or maybe you're setting up a new environment. It's a lot quicker to get that environment set up because there's probably less manual steps you need to take. It's more about, you know, you you install the tools and you run the, you know, launcher or the deploy script and everything just gets deployed. If you're, you know, using that methodology of everything scripted, I can basically tear everything down. And so nothing's there and I can rebuild it, um, with just, you know, writing a script. Um, if you're using that approach, then it's really easy for, for new engineers to get going right away and new environments set up right away. It's a big benefit. Yeah. 100% agree. So I'd also like to dig in and, and, uh, ask each of you for some specific examples, if you can provide any of some real world scenarios where adopting a specific tool made a big impact on your serverless project. I'd say the biggest impact that, that I've seen is the monitoring. It's a lot better than, it, than it used to be, but yeah, when it first serverless first came out, right, all of the monitoring tools you expected to be able to run like an agent on your servers and there wasn't anything good for uh serverless development in and being able to monitor right it's kind of just kind of roll your own uh metrics or logs uh, but yeah there was a lot of tools that came out and that would make it easier and it got better and better too is you know as aws provided more better integration for the tools to get that data out and you know to see what's going on so yeah i I would say that, right? It was the hardest to, you know, to onboard people without the, the monitoring tools that they were used to. So I mean, with the, with them maturing much more now, I think that's less of an issue, but that, that's the real world uh, struggle that I had and uh, where tools made it a lot better, continue to make it better. You know, I mean, I mean, for me, I think, I think as the tools continue to get better, um, it's, it's making it clearer and maybe simpler. Um, there's a lot of, I, I've noticed there's a lot of frameworks like yeah. serverless frameworks that do a lot of abstraction and they focus on making it both simpler or quicker to, you know, build things. Um, a lot of times these abstraction tools really just kind of compile down to a more verbose or different, um, language. I mean, take cloud formation, for example, with AWS which is kind of maybe the bread and butter of how AWS, you know, understands how to set up a resource or configure a resource. You have a CloudFormation stack that 
uh, consists of, um, you know, the scripted, the scripted services, which is, you know, called, we call it cloud formation. And so there's several tools that kind of abstract that cloud formation, um, into a maybe an easier, uh, way to write it. So, you know, I've seen these, these tools. We'll talk a lot about serverless framework because it's uh, a huge tool that, that I use. A lot of people use to it's that abstracted scripting to, you know, configure the services and that, that serverless framework, you know, it basically gets interpreted by AWS or the framework interprets into cloud formation, translates it into cloud formation, which is what, you know, Amazon runs and uh, sets up your services with. So. I would say serverless framework by far is one of the biggest tools that has changed um, how we deal with serverless and work with cloud services like Amazon. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like I I forget right that that's like a tool and and can't even fathom what it would be like to do serverless development without it. So because I, I was using you know lambdas right out of the gate and just playing around with it for you know one off things and. It, right when it was released, you were allowed to edit the code in the um, in the console. So that was like my initial introduction into serverless. But then right afterwards, it was uh, serverless framework and and JAWS, right? And that was like, I couldn't imagine doing like a real development flow and like working locally and deploying and everything without the serverless framework. So it's, I... <laughs> I kind of think of it going hand in hand, right, with with the the tools. So yeah, when when you talk about it, it's like, oh yeah, serverless framework, right, and and the other tools now that that help, right, with the infrastructure as code. I, I mean, yeah, I agree. I agree. I I couldn't imagine deploying a serverless environment without some kind of tool like serverless. You know, that like let's take the AWS console for example, the UI that you can log into. That's nice to be able to view things, maybe tweak things, maybe try something out. But when you're talking about setting up an environment that's probably going to have, you know, several services, that just gets too complex to try to do anything manually to set it up. It, it's got to be deployed with some kind of scripting tool. And so, yeah, serverless has, for us, worked really well. Although I'll say that it's not the only tool we use. You know, we have found where another tool is actually better at doing certain things. Personally, from where I work, we use another tool called Terraform, which is, it, it's a little different from how serverless works. Uh, serverless creates that cloud formation markup, YAML, JSON, and um, AWS deploys a cloud formation stack from that. Terraform is a little different. It doesn't actually create a cloud formation it actually does something a little different where it goes and makes the changes and kind of saves the state of where things are at. And we've noticed that works a little bit better, that Terraform works a little bit better for services that persist data, things like S3 or for databases or other maybe Dynamo, you know, things that uh, store data and persist. We noticed that Terraform is smoother um, in terms of not just, um, you know, keeping that data persisted that's in those services, there's something called, um, uh, well, I, I won't get into it just yet, but, um, I'll just say that we use serverless and Terraform and, you know, we can use them together and we use them for specific things because they have things that they're really good at. And so we try to use that, the things that certain services are good at, you know, we try to, <laughs> We don't just sit on one framework. Basically, we 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 use a few that are good at specific things. That's interesting. How do you uh, like share the configuration between them? Right, like if this right. is up and this is the ID, how do you pass that right to the other framework? So we really think about Terraform. Kind of like I said, uh, sets up those really core pieces of an environment. You know, maybe it's. Uh, like I said, S3 bucket or databases or something like that, infrastructure pieces that like need to set up there. And then we use our serverless to deploy like applications on top of that. So lambdas or API gateways. Serverless is really good about deploying lambda and API gateway. And you can do a few other things with it too. And 
we're um we're a shop that has a lot of lambdas so you know we really focus our serverless projects on just deploying lambdas and api gateways and a few other resources too maybe some ssm parameters if they go with that but those real core infrastructure pieces we do terraform because we like the way it saves the state and so there's this word called drift your um, cloud formation stack could have drift from one version to another. Same thing with like the Terraform states. And again, like I said, the t- Terraform seems to handle that drift a lot better. It, it handles persistent data a lot better. One of those, one trick with cloud formation stacks is, you know, if you delete the stack, you delete all the data that is associated to that stack. So if there's like an S3 bucket associated with it, you might delete all the data in your S3 bucket. Terraform's a little bit safer in terms of how it modifies data and services. And we've had issues with kind of cloud formation where uh, let's say that drift doesn't always line up right and you get some conflicts. Terraform seems to handle conflicts a lot better than the, the cloud formation that serverless creates. So that's one of the things that we've learned over the time with working in a, a serverless environment here. We didn't always have Terraform when we started. We just started with serverless. Um, and then we learned we really needed a, a better tool to set up some of the services. So it, it's certainly a learning game, um, especially, you know, I wouldn't say we're early on with, with you know, serverless right now. But, um, you know, the past, I'd say, four or five years, we've been working with serverless technologies in AWS. Yeah, we've just kind of made that distinction of, you know, serverless is good for this, Terraform's good for this. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I really like that. Um, I've introduced that separation. So like you have the compute layer on a completely different, on a different level than than your uh, data layer. So you can just wipe out the CloudFormation stack if necessary without touching any sensitive data or, you know, having to worry about it changing any databases or <laughs> anything like that so like if you have these di- like dynamo for for example like you've created a, a dynamo table and terraform right um and then you have this lambda that you're deploying through serverless that's reliant on the dynamo table i, I presumably that that id would be an output somewhere from from terraform like how would the lambda ingest that id to know where it's going to be like interacting with with that data. Yeah, we do. At least at our shop, we do a lot of that kind of let's call them maybe global variables or you know attributes in your account. Um, we leverage the system manager parameters SSM in AWS. So say we you know deploy a S three bucket or database with Terraform. Associated with that Terraform is that it deploys those SSM parameters that has, you know, a key with the the name of the bucket, the environment, whatever, and the value, a key for the bucket, and then, you know, let's say the name of the bucket. Um, So there's an SSM parameter available. So then when we go to deploy like our compute layer with serverless in our scripting, we can have the, you know, the key of that SSM parameter linked in there for the bucket and say, okay, this Lambda needs permission to this S3 bucket. And so we use those uh, those some parameters kind of as global variables. Yeah, very interesting paradigm. I really like that that strategy. But yeah, that that's really excellent. And it, sorry. It, it also helps too when you're going like uh, multi-region. I feel like a lot of these tools kind of don't handle that very well. Uh, so that's... That's that's where I've seen it too, like breaking that up, not just the the persistent storage layers, but also helping with uh, you know when you're, when you're going multi region, and you know there's replication between some of those persistent storage layers and, and things like that. Uh, a lot of the tools, uh, yeah, don't really aren't really set up to do with that. Yeah, so breaking it up, I I completely agree with that. And yeah, using the parameter store is a great way to go. Using the the right tool for the job. That's a great example. And you mentioned Terraform too, and a lot of people think of Terraform as just like infrastructure as code. But um, you know, as a sort of a different example, um, I I like using um, AWS's Cloud Development Kit, the CDK, as an infrastructure as code tool. 
And I've had su success with that, with deploying lambdas, because you can have your lambdas sitting, your app code sitting right alongside your uh, your infrastructure code. So you do have that tighter integration. But uh, yeah, I mean, that that's it, it provides another easy way to be able to deploy uh, your API gateway with, you know, backed by lambdas. So yeah, that, that's just like another alternative that, that I've had some success with before. But yeah, what other, uh, what other tools do you guys like? I mean, uh, what are some of your favorite tools to use when working with serverless and like why, why adopt those tools? I know we talked about serverless quite a bit, Terraform to a degree. Were there any others that you guys would definitely advocate for? Maybe I'll steer the conversation or just my answer back towards, um, you know, the development environment a little bit and, uh, you know, talk about how are you going to develop locally? Um, how are you going to do your unit testing? There is a great library for Python and there might be libraries that exist for other languages too. Um, but maybe we're primarily a, a Python shop when it comes to application code. So, you know, as you know, Bodo 3 is the, a library from AWS that allows you to interact with AWS services. Well, there's a, a testing library that is developed called Modo, that's with an M, that essentially allows you to mock AWS services um, locally. And we've been having a lot of success with this Modo library to, you know, there's a little bit of configuration you have to do in some of your testing files, but you essentially can mock services like DynamoDB and S3, um, Secrets Manager, that kind of thing. You can, you can mock those out and get the same response format that you would get with Bodo 3. So for like unit testing and even, you know, doing some local development, you know, you can run your unit tests locally to kind of help get an idea that then Moto library has really improved our, our, um, our code quality, um, for unit testing. I don't think it's a full replacement for deploying your code to the, um, you know, an actual AWS environment, but it, it re really gets you farther, um, locally. So I really like that one Moto. Yeah. That, that's excellent. Um, Tom, did you have any other thoughts? Like, I know we talked about serverless as basically, you know, the measuring stick, you know, the serverless framework when it comes to like comparing other tools. Did you have any others that you wanted to advocate for that you um, prefer to use? You know, I've, I've tried a lot of them and I'm always drawn back to serverless framework. And I think the, the biggest sticking feature is how they do plugins. Uh, and you can really, you know, just ex expand what it does versus some of the native tools like SAM or, or CDK, right? It's, it's just the, the cloud formation and you can now do, uh, you know, cloud formation functions and have it do different things or whatever. But, um, yeah, the, the ecosystem around the, the plugins for, uh, for serverless framework, like something new comes out and maybe it's not supported by, cloud formation yet or um just the the integration is 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 wonky right and just that abstraction layer of you know easily throwing in a plug-in and it can make it nice and, and pretty right with my uh serverless framework templating is is really nice um i haven't had the chance to play around the the other ones um recently um but yeah i think there's a lot of advancements in it so but yeah, that's what always hold, pulls me back in the service framework. It's like, I, does none of them do this? Oh, service framework does. Oh, it's a plugin. That's why. I totally agree with that. And we we leverage quite a few plugins for serverless. Like you said, I think that puts it a little step ahead of AWS SAM and S CDK, which are similar. But, you know, we leverage plugins like um, you can create, uh, you know, IAM roles for each of your Lambda functions. That's a requirement we have from security. So Lambdas are kind of all on their own security group or things like associating a web application firewall to your, um, your API gateway or um, a really cool one. Um, we, for our API applications, we like to use Flask library on our Lambdas. And there's a plugin called serverless WSGI which makes uh, integration between the API gateway payload that we get 
and the Flask um, format. Um, it does that integration for us to translate that payload. So we can use Flask on our Lambdas and really structure our code in a very, um, I don't want to say correct, but, you know, in a very, um, in a way that makes sense for, um, you know, kind of a, um, an API application would like, uh, there's no, no view on this, but, uh, you know, a controller and a model type of application that plugin really helps. And there's a lot of other ones. I know, I think we've leveraged a step functions plugin to help with step functions. Certainly, um, a plugin called, um, there's a serverless Python requirements, which can help you create a layer uh, with your Lambda of your you know, third-party dependencies you want to pull in. That brings up another... Uh, nice one. Yeah, it is. It brings up another uh, tool with Python that we like to use called Poetry to basically uh, define our third-party resources, um, our source resources, and... Um, Poetry helps us um, work. Poetry works with the serverless Python requirements plugin to help build that layer of third party resources. It's it very smooth and um, it, it works great. Yeah, I I concur. The uh, when they can p- package it up right and make it certain things that are a lot bigger and aren't going to change as much so to automatically make it a layer. And then you don't have to worry about deploying. makes the deployments a lot faster. Those are re- really nice. I do. <clears throat> Um, done a lot of development with, with TypeScript with these and just like the automatic integration with like tree shaking and, and things like that and just optimizing like what code has changed so you don't have to, you know, recompile, transpile uh, the, the different things that are changing and just, you know, having it watch for changes automatically deploying. Um, yeah. Makes it really nice. That is really nice. Yeah, I've got a brush up on the serverless framework plugins because <laughs> yeah a lot of those sound really convenient um we are coming up on time but i wanted to have a little bit of room for some uh closing thoughts so um i guess we'll start with you preston any closing thoughts on the dev tools in a serverless environment um well you know kind of like we were saying i think they're only getting better i, I don't think they're you know perfect uh the way they are right now i think I, I'd like a little more help with local development. Um, but, um, you know, fortunately, if you're not running your services a lot, it's it's not a lot of money to run a development environment. Um, if you're being conscious about not having, you know, services that cost a lot of money running for a long period of time, you can get away with deploying your um, code to setting up your environment in an actual dev environment. But I mean, what we have right now is, you know, engineers a lot of power to script their services and and deploy them, you know, with with one command, and boom, you have a serverless environment running pretty quickly. So we're certainly able to get off the ground and get going really fast. I think now we're just looking at polishing these tools that we have and getting, you know, more support that maybe we had with a, a traditional environment, but it, it's certainly not going to hinder you from from starting development now so pretty happy <laughs> overall looking forward to what's next absolutely tom closing thoughts yeah i'm uh pretty excited but yeah what's what's coming out and and what's changing i, I feel like there's a lot of uh i don't maybe we talk about this in another episode but there's a lot of providers out now that are either making their own abstractions on top of AWS or kind of doing like their own, their own way of, of developing, uh, that comes to mind is like AMP. They're a spinoff out of the serverless framework company that's kind of doing their own thing where that one, you don't have as much access to the AWS resources that get spun up, but other things like, uh, like SST, um, I don't know if played around with those, but, uh, that one's uh, very interesting as well. So, and in the space that they're going, they kind of were tied to CDK, but are now kind of doing their own engine for some of the things that yeah we, we talked about here. But yeah, it's very exciting to see what's uh, what's coming out. It's new. It's changing. Excellent. Yeah, I think that this is definitely a topic that's uh, kind of difficult to contain in a single half hour. So that definitely warrants uh, uh, a second. To- sequel episode coming up hopefully soon <laughs> so yeah, ever-growing topic always new things coming out and uh yeah. 
always new methodologies. I think that's important to point out that there's there's people that are always thinking of new ways to chain these tools together to you know make their dev environment or their ecosystem work for them. Uh, excellent. Yeah. Cool. So I guess with that we can uh, we can wrap up for for this episode. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank all of our listeners for tuning in to Lunch with Tech Leaders. We hope you found the conversation informative and valuable. We would love to have you join us again for our next episode, Influencing Teams to Stay on Top of New Tech. As always, the episode will feature expert guests and interactive conversations, so be sure to tune in. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.